All right, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I can present to you Mike Slater. Cool. Give it up. Nice stalling, brother. Good work. <laughs> awesome. How are you guys? America's the greatest country in the world. Yeah. Beautiful. That was awesome. That was like a war cry. Hey, everyone, say hi to the Blaze Radio. Yeah. Blaze Radio, Foothills Christian Church, welcome to their men's retreat. I'm so glad you guys invited me to be here. This is awesome. Um, I got to be honest, though, and I don't know what Mike was saying about my life recently, uh, but I would love a nap. I would love a nap. Uh, last time I spoke at Foothills Church, it was about three years ago, and it just happened to be about two, three weeks after my dad passed away. He died of a stroke suddenly. Um, so I got, it was a great chance to talk about my dad and lessons I learned from my dad. And Pastor Don called me a few weeks ago and told me about this conference and asked if I could speak. And I said, I'd love to, but I got to put an asterisk on my appearance because my wife is due with our first baby two weeks before today. So yes, I'll do it, but I don't know what's going to happen. So I, you need to have a backup just in case. Uh, God is good. My son was born nine days ago. Do we have the little guy? I think we got a picture of the little guy here. There he is. He was, he's 12 hours old right there. I'm not kidding. Look at him. His name's uh, Jack. Jack Slater. That's what I'm talking about. All right, yeah. Jack Wilder Slater. So he's destined to either be uh, an author or an action hero. I don't know which. I'm hoping action hero. So yeah, I haven't slept in nine days. Amen. So that's why I would love a nap. Um, <laughs> just how out of it I am. I, I, it's trash day on Tuesdays, right? So uh, I went the other day to bring the trash out to the, the curb. And I got to the curb and there was a guy there. And he said, um, what are you doing? I said, I'm bringing the trash out. He said, trash day's uh, uh, Tuesdays. And I said, yeah. He goes, it's Thursday. <laughs> so I, I did this very stinky walk of shame, taking my trash back to the garage. <laughs> oh. So we have a ton of trash piled up in our garage, but I think that's just the way it goes. Uh, hopefully I'll remember when this Tuesday comes around. Uh, anyway, the point is the timing of this is all too amazing, right? Last time I was here, my dad passed away, and now here I am, a brand new dad. Um, everything's been awesome about fatherhood so far. Um, although I got to admit, who here is a dad? All right, everyone. So, that here, so, that, so like I'm a little, like no, no joke, like I feel unworthy to be here. Uh, I feel like I'm a 16-year-old who just got his driver's license lecturing a bunch of NASCAR drivers <laughs> on like, like how to be safe on the roads. It's like, what am I doing here? This is, this is absurd for me to be up here in front, but um, it's been okay so far. Uh, the best, well, let me say, so people have been giving me a lot of advice, and I just want to say one thing. There's one thing that no one told me at all, and I got a ton of advice, but no one told me this, and I'm a little mad. Like, out of all the new dads, or all the dads who knew I was going to be a new dad, even all the women who knew I was going to be a new dad, no one told me about the umbilical cord. <laughs> that is the grossest nastiest thing. It stanks. It's gooey. It dry, it's like dried up flesh that falls off. And now I'm telling guys, they're like, oh yeah, no big deal. But what are you talking about? It's nasty. So no one told me about that. And I'm really mad at everyone. Um, but that's cool, I guess. Or maybe, I don't know, now that I'm saying this, maybe that's like part of dad code is to not tell new. That's like the initiation. <laughs> Whatever you do, don't tell the new dad about the umbilical cord. So I, I guess I won't tell the new dad that. Um, I want to start off here. I'm, I'm, before I get to my main party, I'm just super grateful to be here, and I'm grateful that you guys are here. Uh, you don't need to be, and the world tells you not to be. I was asking someone how to be a good parent the other day, and he said, uh, you're asking, you'll be fine. Uh, you're here, so you're wondering, you're searching. Jeremiah said, don't boast in anything, boast though, in that you know me, you know God. And that's why you guys are here, and I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for men that I can lock shields with, because we're all going on different adventures. My favorite grateful story, real quick, is this Mike's phone? Yeah. Did you leave it here? I'm sorry, brother. I don't want you to be without. 
Oh, this is cool to have an earpiece mic. I'm not used to that. Usually I'm tethered to the stage. Um, my favorite grateful story is, is Bud. Uh, anyone here listening to the show has ever heard Bud before? World War II veteran Bud? Does that ring a bell? It'll ring a bell when I get going here. So this was awesome. This was like two years ago. Someone emailed me and said, Slater, I just met my neighbor. He is baller. He's a World War II veteran who's just sharp as a tack, and you got to talk to him on the air. So we did. We called up Bud, and he came on. He was awesome. And he told this story about his parents and how they traveled from the Ukraine all the way to Amsterdam, got on the back of a shipping container, made it to New York City, you know, did the whole immigrant story thing and, and made it to live a, a middle class life um, just outside New York City. And middle class, like by their standard, but poor by our standards today. And Bud tells the story of one afternoon he was on the front porch with his dad and he said something. He doesn't remember what, but it was something that showed a little bit of ungratefulness about America or about their station in life or whatever. And his dad grabbed him from the back of the neck, grabbed him from the neck, picked him up, carried him to the middle of the street in front of his house and said, look at this street. These streets are paved with gold. He says, we have a business. Your uncles have jobs. We have food on the table. We can go to church whenever we want. In America, the streets are paved with gold. And I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful that in America we can worship him freely. Amen. For now, at least. So let's enjoy while we can. One quick more story, one more story about Bud. I asked Bud for a war story. And he's like, all right. So he was in World War II, a tank commander. So he's telling the story about how he was uh, in, in Germany or Italy, and he was in the tank, and they were riding along, and they came across a frozen turkey, a cooked, a cooked frozen turkey was in the middle of the way. And it was daytime, and they said, well, we're not going to go out and get it now because uh, there could be a sniper. So they waited till it got dark. They got out, and they got the cooked turkey that was frozen. They brought it inside the tank, and they couldn't eat it because it was frozen. So they took their knives, and they used it as chisels, and they chiseled off frozen pieces of turkey and threw them in the back of their mouths until they melted and then chewed and swallowed. And I said, Bud, that's not a war story. <laughs> he said, no, but it was the greatest meal of my life. That's a man who's grateful. It's not an epic battle story, but war rarely has those. These are Bud's words. He said, war is full of men, not always scared, usually terrified. Not always fully prepared, mostly having no idea what to do or how to do it. And not old and battle-tested, but 17. Bud was 17 when he was a tank commander in World War II. Wow. But full of men knowing exactly why we're doing it. And it's that sense of purpose that I value so much, and that's what I want more of. And that's what you guys are doing here now, right? We're in a war. We are in a spiritual war. Amen? Amen. C.S. Lewis said, the world is enemy-occupied territory, and we are taking part in a great campaign of sabotage. I love that. And I'll have time to go into this now, but you guys know the story of uh, 2 Kings 2, when Elisha uh, say, uh, says to his, uh, about his servant, he says, oh Lord, open his eyes and let him see. And the clouds just open up, and he see, the servant just sees horses and chariots of fire and angels that are protecting them. That is the spiritual war that is going on around us, and we are in desperate need of courageous men. Yeah. And just a quick programming note to everyone listening on The Blaze, the theme of this weekend is courageous. And also, I'm sorry, did I do a trigger warning for everyone on the radio? I don't think I did. Trigger warning for everyone on the radio. Uh, you're going to hear in the next few minutes the word Jesus, and I'm going to quote from a book called The Bible. So I know you guys are cool with that, you're expecting that, but some people are tuning into the radio not necessarily expecting that. So uh, I just want to get everyone straight about what's going to happen here in the next few minutes. Yeah. And I don't apologize. No one apologizes. All right, so I asked uh, Pastor Don what I, what I should talk about, and he wrote down, what I want to teach my son about courage in a crazy culture. Perfect. So every great speech has three points. I have four. Bear with me. Sorry. Radio guy, it's hard to get me off the stage. So I met someone the other day, I asked for his advice, as I always did, as I always do, and again, he didn't mention anything about the umbilical cord, but he said, pray for your son's salvation every day. 
Uh, and I said, why? There's a story behind that, sir. And he said, yes. Uh, he said, I was a Christian, and I had my daughter, and I assumed that it would rub off on her. And one day, she was three years old, and he asked her what she thinks about Jesus, and he said, uh, she said, Daddy, I don't care about Jesus. I love Mickey Mouse. <laughs> and he said, this is a problem. He said, I was never intentional enough from day one. I needed to be more intentional. I think that's great advice. So in the name of being intentional, I have three prayers that I've been praying for my son, uh, and I will do them in order of descending importance. So my first prayer for Jack is to love Jesus. And it's not only to love Jesus, uh, yes, but it's to love truth. We live in a post-truth society. Everything's subjective, everything's relative. John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. Culture's messed up, gentlemen. We all know that, right? Do we even have to spend the next 50 minutes talking about this? We can talk about gay marriage. Um, I don't think marriage is going to be an institution much longer. Forget about men going into women's bathrooms. The very concept of gender is under attack. There's a movement going on now to get doctors to not assign gender at birth because when a doctor says whether you're a man or a woman, that's, or a boy or a girl, that's just their opinion. I'm not kidding. There's a movement to, to wait until the child can decide what gender they are for themselves. I'm being serious. That's legit. NBC News did a YouTube video, a five-minute YouTube news video about how gen, uh, doctors shouldn't assign gender at birth anymore. There's legit hospitals around the country who are giving puberty-blocking hormones to kids that, that prevent puberty so that it's easier to have sex change operations when they get older. And this is all based on little kids saying that they're a boy or whether they feel like a girl or whatever, vice versa, right? This is real stuff going on. We could spend the entire time talking about a crazy culture. Everyone gets a trophy. No such thing as winning. Everyone is racist or a victim or a bigot, a baby in the womb. It's not really a baby if you don't want it. Then it's just tissue. And by the way, real quick on abortion, uh, I could talk about this all day too, but the, one of the great lies in our culture today about abortion is that it's a woman's issue. 75% of the women who get an abortion say that they were pressured by a man. Do not let anyone silence you or shut you up by saying it's a woman's issue. It is a man's issue. And we need more men. And we can cut abortion down a ton. Colleges, colleges have safe spaces. Have you guys heard about safe spaces? These are rooms where 18 to 22-year-old adults go, and there are kittens and coloring books and bubbles, and they go there when they want to avoid to hearing an opinion different than their own. I'm not even kidding. Talk about courage, right? <laughs> Pathetic. All right, you get it. You know it. I don't need to go anymore. So what's the answer to all this? Jesus? So we have a, a fetish for diversity in our country. It's weird. Um, we always are told to focus on what makes us different. And we focus on what makes us different, then we focus on what divides us. we got to focus instead on the things that we have in common. And no matter what your skin color is, what your background, your income, your political persuasion, whatever, we have Jesus in common, the men in this room we do. Amen. And we got to get back to that in America because in the end, that's all that matters. All right, who, uh, who here i got to watch my time. I didn't think I'd go long enough, and I'm already running out of time. Uh, who here has been following the election? Show of hands. <laughs> who here is ready for it to be over? <laughs> All right, amen. Uh, me too. You burnt out? Yeah. Yeah. Me too. Uh, here's why, and I realized this just the other day. It's all junk food. <laughs> it's a bunch of junk food, and I've been eating junk food for a year and a half doing this politics stuff, and it feels unfulfilling. Now, it's important, right? Don't get me wrong. It's important, but it's so much junk food. I have to focus on things and consume more things that are eternal Amen. because those are the only things that are fulfilling. And Jesus is truth and eternal. And I guarantee you, if you ever feel unfulfilled and burn out, if you just focus on him again, then you will feel, feel fulfilled again. One of my favorite lines, Paul in Ephesians, he says, when we reach our unity or says we only reach unity, excuse me, when we reach unity in our knowledge of Jesus, then we won't be tossed back and forth by the waves. 
and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. There is so much deceitful scheming going on. I want my son to love Jesus so that he won't be deceived. Point number two, I, I pray, and, and I, I pray that my, uh, my son Jack loves his mom. One of the best pieces of advice I've ever received is that the best gift you can give your children is a loving marriage. Love your wife and adore her, they told me. You guys know Ephesians 5, 25, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. What did Christ do for the church? I love this line too cleansing her by the washing with water, water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish but holy and blameless. What a commission. Wow. What a command. Jack needs to see that every day because how I love my wife is how Jack is going to treat women, right? And Romans 12 says, do not conform to the pattern of this world. There is no better way to not conform to the pattern of the world than to respect women. Pornography, lust, objectification. Like the world, this culture is dripping in these, these evil things. So to respect women is the ultimate in manliness. Who here has seen the movie Gladiator? Obviously. If you haven't, you can just step out. We don't... I don't have any need for you here. I'm sorry. Um, wasn't that a prerequisite for attending the Courage Conference? I think. So my favorite scene of the whole movie is when you got Maximus and, and, uh, and, and Marcus, the, the emperor, right? They're talking. Actually, my favorite, my favorite part of this scene is not what I wanted to mention, but my favorite part is when uh, Marcus says, Maximus, I want you to become the emperor of Rome when I die. And Maximus says, with all my heart, no. And Marcus says, that is exactly why it must be you. I love that. Because that's like the, the, the reluctant leader story, which I love. So anyway, that's not the part I wanted to mention. Just before that, literally the lines before that, Russell Crowe, Maximus, goes into describing his home, and he's talking about how the sun shines into the kitchen, and he talks about the different tri- types of trees on his property, and he talks about how the soil is black like his wife's hair, and there's wild horses that play with his son. And Marcus asks Maximus how many days it's been since he's been home. He says, two years, 264 days in this morning. But who's counting, right? This is a man, the manliest of men, right? Who loves his wife and his family. And that's the only place he really wants to be. Building his home. And Marcus says, I envy you, Maximus. It is a good home worth fighting for? And he nods his head, yes. Is your home worth fighting for? Is what you're building at home worth fighting for? Is your marriage something glorious, spectacular, something that glorifies God? That's the meaning of marriage, right? That's the purpose of marriage, right? It's an institution to glorify God. That's why I don't think it will exist much longer because most people don't realize that, so why do it anymore? Tax purposes, really, is all there is anymore. I want to build my family on a rock, and it starts with loving him and then loving my wife fully. That builds up Jack. And I just, I, I pray that Jack knows how to treat women, not just holding doors and pulling out chairs, but deeply loving and protecting and celebrating the love of his life and washing her hair with the word. Mm. And I look forward to his wedding day. Every dad tells me it'll be here before you know it. Is that right, dads? Who have been there? So number two, I want him to love his wife, or his mom. Um, Number three, I want him to love people. Love and serve people. Philippians 2, 3, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Uh, I want to share a story of Tom Hudner and Jesse Brown, one of my favorite stories. These two men came from totally opposite backgrounds, could not be more opposite. Jesse was born in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, 1926, son of a sharecropper, lived in a shack, dirt floor, went out and farmed every single day, just like his dad, just like his dad before that, and just like everyone he ever knew. But he grew up, or when he grew up, all he wanted to do was become a fighter pilot. 
and people laughed at him. They said, Jesse, they won't even let black people in an airplane, let alone fly an airplane for the Navy. Jesse Brown became the first black fighter pilot in Navy history. Tom Hunter. Tom's grandfather and dad owned a bunch of grocery stores in, in the Northeast somewhere. Super wealthy family, made it through the Depression, no problem. Country club folks, went to Harvard. The plan was for Tom to go to Harvard, just like his dad and grandpa, and take over the family business and live a comfortable life. Instead, against his family wishes, he joined the Navy and became a fighter pilot. These two men, totally opposite backgrounds, became best of friends. Fast forward to the Korean War. You got six pilots in the air. Jesse and Tom are two of them. Jesse's plane is hit, crashes into the side of a mountain in what's in uh, North Korea today. A violent crash. Jesse wakes up, takes off his helmet and gloves, opens up the canopy, try to get out, but realizes he's stuck from the waist down. He then accidentally drops his helmet out of the plane, so he loses all communication. The other pilots are flying overhead, and they see Jesse waving. But Tom sees not just his friend. He sees Jesse's wife and two-year-old daughter. So Tom decided to do something that no one has ever done before and no one has ever done since. He crash-landed a perfectly good airplane right next to his friend to try and save his life. Value others above yourselves, right? So Tom crashed, he escaped his plane, ran over to Jesse, couldn't pull him out. He found an ax, started hacking at the airplane, but it was frozen solid, didn't make any progress there at all. A helicopter finally came and landed, it was getting dark, and the pilot said, Tom, you have two choices. You can either stay here and die with Jesse, or you can come with me right now and get out of here. But I have to leave right now. Hardest decision in Tom's life, but before he could say anything, Jesse said, Tom, tell my wife I love her. There's a lot more to the story after that. There's a book called Devotion. I recommend you reading it. It's great. It's about these two men and their families. Why do I share this story? Uh, you, me, you were Jesse. You crash landed. You were stranded. Stuck, freezing, desperate, dying. Jesus crash landed to save you. First of all, let's go back one second. Amen. Were, were you Jesse? Amen. Ever? Were you ever Jesse in your life? Yeah. Yeah. Jesus crash landed to save me. That's Jesus dying on the cross. Where Tom couldn't save Jesse, Jesus can. Jesus did. He does every day. That is the perfect sinless Jesus nailed to the cross taking on the sin of the world to the point where God leaves him and Jesus cries out, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's the physical and emotional pain of taking on the sin of the world, dying so that you can live, so that we can live. Now, we've been saved, but I don't know about you, but I still need to be rescued every day. Every day I crash and I'm stuck and I open the canopy and I wave for help and no one helps. <laughs> Nothing helps. Things don't help. People disappoint but Jesus always rescues and saves. Amen. I think of how I've hurt my wife, to go back to the last point. I think about ways I've hurt my wife, how I've disappointed her, how I don't date her like I promised I always would, how I don't listen to her, how I don't consider her first like she deserves. So I need Jesus to crash land for me, and I need him to rescue me again and again and again. Tom Hudner, he earned the Medal of Honor for what he did in Korea. It's an amazing story because his, uh, Jesse was there, Jesse's wife was there, but she was black, so she actually couldn't even find a hotel to stay in in D.C. at the time. She was the only black person in the audience when he earned the Medal of Honor. But anyway, Tom's captain said, there's been no finer act of unselfish heroism in military history. And what Jesus did for us, there's been no finer act of unselfish heroism in human history. Now, you may be thinking, Slater, that's a nice story about Tom and Jesse, but I will never in any circumstance have to crash land an airplane to save someone's life. Uh, you're kind of missing the point. But <laughs> let me bring it a little more relevant. Jesse told his wife before he left for war that if I die, I want you to take life insurance money and I want you to go to college and become a teacher, which, is your, which was her dream. He died. She got the money. 
But right when she did, right before she was to go to college, Tom, excuse me, Jesse's uh, mom died. So she used that money to take care of his dad. At the same time, Tom had a homecoming parade at his hometown. At the end of the parade, the mayor gave him a check for $1,000. It was money that he collected from all the townspeople. Gave him a check for 1000 bucks. said, Tom, go buy yourself a car. Tom sent the check to Jesse's wife so that she could become a teacher. Opportunities like that come up every day in our lives. If we want to see them, that's the difference. They're there for everyone. It's just if we want to see them or not. I want Jack to be a kid who's always on the lookout. I want, this is the moment that I'm looking forward to. I hope it happens. I don't know. I want Jack to go into the school cafeteria in middle school and see a kid eating by himself and go over and sit with him. I want Jack to be a, a kid who sees someone getting picked on and gets his John 2 Jesus on. Do you know what I'm talking about my, my John 2 Jesus? Yeah. This is one of my favorite memes. Guys, we have this meme up here we can throw up here. For everyone on the radio, it says, it, it says, if anyone ever asks you what would Jesus do, remind him that flipping over tables and chasing people with a whip is within the realm of possibilities. <laughs> right, so like, um, Jesus has been quite feminized over these years, huh? Yeah. Nothing feminine about that. Has anyone here ever seen the movie Billy Madison? Maybe I should, maybe, for the sake of time, maybe I should just skip this reference. There's a scene, <laughs> I shouldn't do this, in church. No, this has never been referenced in church. I don't think Billy Madison. Uh, there's a scene where one of the kids wets his pants, right? Yeah. Right, there you go. Amen, younger guys over there. And, and Billy, the cool kid, pours water on his pants and says, wetting your pants is the coolest. <laughs> and then all the other kids wet their pants. But yeah, the point is, you, do you know what I'm saying? Am I straying too far? The point is, I want my son to, to be on the lookout for ways to serve and love people. And I want him to serve people quietly, never looking for recognition, because the true recognition he, he will know, I hope, comes from above. So those are my three things. Love Jesus, love his mom, love and serve others. But I got 20 more minutes. Uh, is everyone cool? You guys have been awesome. Like, sit, like you just been sitting and listening all day, and all day yesterday. I appreciate that. Um, here's the fourth thing, though, that's been on my mind that I want to share here and, and chat about. And I think it fits in nicely with the theme of courage. If I'm trying to be, if I was, um, if I was trying to be nice to a secular audience, I would say something like, um, I, I want my son to live a life of adventure. Right? That's good. But that's not really what I want. I want my son to live a life of suffering. Now, the theme of the weekend here is courageous. Why do I want my son to live a life of suffering? You don't need to be courageous if there's nothing to be courageous against. Right? You don't need to be courageous if there's nothing to be courageous for. So if I pray that my son lives a life of ease and comfort and luxury, he'll never have a need to be courageous. So what are we doing here? What's the point? Just go home, watch football. We, want, we all want to be courageous, right? Doesn't every man want to be courageous? So we have to suffer then. But the world says to avoid suffering, and everything in the world is made to avoid suffering, and we wonder why we have a lack of courage. Because we've avoided the thing you need in order to be courageous. If there's no suffering, there's no need for masculinity. Now, full disclosure on, on where this is coming from. So I'm on diaper duty, right? My wife's doing the breastfeeding. I'm on diaper duty. Now, Jack doesn't cry much, right? But he squalls when we change his diaper. And mom realized that it's because his wet wipes are too cold. <laughs> so she went to Target and bought this, this box that keeps the wet wipes warm. So that when dad wipes his bottom, he doesn't get too cold. 
That's what I call a first world problem. So while I preach here about how I want my son to live a life of suffering, I will admit that I am the same person who uses slightly warmed wet naps on my son's bum <laughs> to make him comfortable. I am ashamed. <laughs> Seriously, every time I've used them, I'm like, oh, I'm sorry, son. It's going to be a cruel, cruel world. You will not always have slightly warmed wet naps for your bum. Okay, so now we're all, so uh, it's all in the open now, right? A huge hypocrite. I want to play this scene here from the movie 300. Uh, when you watch this, watch the wolf. The wolf is the devil. Uh, the wolf is everything that the devil has done to confuse and twist and deceive our culture and our boys and us. And I know all of us want to raise our sons to be a Leonidas. Constantly tested, tossed into the wild, left to pit his wits and will against nature's fury. It was his initiation, his time in the wild, for he would return to his people as Spartan, or not at all. Warfare. The wolf begins to circle the boy. Claws of black steel, fur as dark night, eyes glowing red, jewels from the pit of hell itself. The giant wolf, sniffing, savoring the scent of the meal to come. Grips him, only a heightened sense of things. The cold air in his lungs. Windswept pines moving against the coming night. His hands are steady. His fall. God, send my son wolves and give him the tools to, to kill them. Seneca, in the year 50, he said, no prize fighter can go with high spirits into the battle if he's never been beaten black and blue. The only contestant that can confidently enter the battle is the man who has seen his own blood, who has felt his teeth rattle beneath his opponent's fists, who has been tripped and felt the full force of his opponent's charge, who has been downed in body but not in spirit, one who, as often as he falls, rises again with greater defiance than ever. So then, fortune has often in the past gotten the upper hand of you, and yet you have not surrendered, but have leaped up and stood your guard still more eagerly. For manliness gains much strength by being challenged. Douglas MacArthur, Supreme Allied Commander during World War II, he was in Australia when his son Arthur was born. Yes, Arthur MacArthur. He prayed for his son. He said, build me a son, O Lord, who will be strong enough to know when he is weak, humility, and brave enough to face himself when he is afraid, like you just saw there with Leonidas. One who will be proud and unbending in honest defeat and humble and gentle in victory. Build me a son whose wishes will not take the place of deeds, a man of action, a man who will know you, and that to know himself is the foundation stone of knowledge. And this is the key. Lead him, I pray, not in the path of ease and comfort, but under the stress and spur of difficulties and challenge. Here, let him learn to stand up in the storm. Here, let him learn compassion for those who fail. Teddy Roosevelt was a baller. He led the Rough Riders. He read the Iliad and the Odyssey and the original Greek twice in his life, once when he was a cattle rancher in the Badlands and once when he was president of the United States of America. 
And he spoke often about the over-softness of men. He wrote about how we need to live the strenuous life. And he said this, he said, if we read the Bible properly, we read a book which teaches us to go forth and do the work of the Lord. That kind of work can be done only by the man who is neither a weakling nor a coward. By the man who is in the fullest sense of the word, a true Christian. We plead, we pray for a closer and wider and deeper study of the Bible so that our people in America may be in fact, as well as in theory, doers of the word and not only hearers. So think about this here. Um, I'm just going to be real. All men want to feel valued, right? Don't we want to be, we want to be accepted and valued, right? Ever since kickball teams were picked on the playground, right? And you wanted to get picked first and you sure didn't want to get picked last. You've always wanted to be chosen and selected and, and valued. Wouldn't it be awesome if Teddy Roosevelt said, you, what's your name, sir, in the blue shirt? Bill? We'll do both of you. Bill, you, Bill, are a true Christian man. I want you to join the Rough Riders. <gasps> yeah! I don't even know what we're going to do, but that sounds awesome. <laughs> Sir, your name? John. John. Wouldn't it be awesome if a Navy SEAL came up to you and said, John, we need you for this mission. You are the man. You are uniquely qualified for this mission. Your country needs you, and your fe these fellow Navy SEALs, we need you. All right. What do you need? Let's do it. What if Maximus came? What if William Wallace came to you and said, I need you. Your, your name, sir. Gary. Gary, I need you to join my ranks. Hoorah. We can't win without you. Amen. <laughs> Think about how that makes you feel in your gut, right? Fired up. I'm chosen. I'm wanted. I'm valued. Forget about those men. Not to break it to you, but the story of William Wallace is actually kind of made up. I talked to the author, the guy who wrote the book, the, 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 the screenplay. It's pretty much made up, okay? Fake, fantasy, not real. Forget it. God has chosen you. How come we don't get the same calling in our stomach as the one, like if a Navy SEAL said, we need you for this mission? Isn't that weird? Is that just me? Right, Navy SEAL says, we need you right now for this mission. We're gonna win. We can't win this battle without you. I'm feeling pretty good about myself. God has called you for the exact same thing, but infinitely more important, eternally important. I don't know, sometimes I don't get the same, I don't know, same passion about it. If William Wallace, Teddy Roosevelt, Jesus, MacArthur, whoever, all, or Douglas MacArthur and Jesus asked you to be on their team and fight their battle and you had to pick one, we'd all have to choose God and Jesus. You'd have to. And good news, here we are. Amen. Now Suffer. Now, of course, we don't suffer for suffering's sake, right? What good is that? We're not martyrs like that. We suffer to glorify Jesus. Yes, yes. 2 Corinthians 11, Paul, right? He lists through all the things he's done or he's been a victim to. Prison, five times been, been lashed by the, the Jews, three times beaten with rods, pelt with stones, shipwrecked, spent a night and a day in the open sea, constantly on the move, danger at sea, in the country, in the city. He's labored and toiled, gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst. I've gone without food. I've been cold and naked. But during his conversion, the Lord said to Ananias, you remember, go, this man is a chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and to the kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer in my name. And then he did. Second Corinthians, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed. Why suffer? And I'm almost done here. It goes on in 2 Corinthians. This light momentary affliction, which Paul just went through, right? This light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. So maybe if you join the Navy SEALs and you win a battle, ah, you get a medal or something. Cool. 
it'll rust, whatever. This is a way to glory beyond all comparison. So there's something in uh, literary circles called the hero's journey. Is anyone familiar with this? The hero's journey. So if you want to write a great story, you just use this outline. So Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter, like you name it. Like every great story has the same Lord of the Rings. Like it's the same story. Hero receives a call for adventure. So as I'm reading these, like think about your favorite movie and how it fits into it. They all do. Hero receives a call to adventure. Le he leaves his original life. Receives supernatural aid, the force, wizard powers, right? Gathers allies for his quest. Chewbacca, and all right? <laughs> Faces trials and challenges. Undergoes a physical ordeal. Dies a physical or spiritual death. Undergoes a transformation. Shares the reward and wisdom that he's gained with others. Overcomes the evil and gains greater freedom. That's how it works. Every story, every great story. That's your story. <laughs> That's your salvation story, isn't it? Yeah, it? You became a Christian. That's the adventure. You left your old life. You gained the Holy Spirit. That's supernatural aid. You joined a church. That's your band of brothers. You faced trials. You underwent a transformation. That's the baptism. You share your wisdom with others. That's what we're all called to do. And in the end, you gain greater, you gain greater freedom heaven. I want that for Jack, but you can't do it without trials. I love this quote from C.S. Lewis. He says, I quite agree that the Christian religion is in the long run a thing of unspeakable comfort, but it does not begin in comfort. In religion, as in war and everything else, comfort is the one thing you cannot get by looking for it. If you look for truth, you may find comfort in the end. If you look for comfort, you will get neither comfort or truth. Only soft soap or warm wet naps <laughs> and wishful thinking to begin with and in the end, despair. Don't look for comfort, look for truth. So I pray that Jack faces and overcomes many trials because these are gifts from God. Truly, they're gifts Philippians 1.29, this is mind-boggling to me. This is my last scripture, I think. I'm almost done here. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. So the Greek word here for gifted, for granted, it's not, it's didomi is the word that's like, uh, it's to give basically a bad thing. Like, I'm going to give you a punch in the nose, right? Like, like, that's bad. This is the Greek word that means to give in kindness, to give graciously, um, to give forgiveness would be this, this word as well. So God has graciously given us two gifts, faith and suffering. How different from the world, right? How different? Parents in America are praying for their children to live a life of comfort and ease. And I pray that my son lives a life of suffering for Christ. Amen. Why? Because it's right in the good book. I lied. This is my last scripture, Romans 5. We also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, character, hope. I really appreciate you guys being here. I know I threw a lot at you. Um, and I know you've been taking in a lot of stuff all weekend. Here's my takeaway, if nothing else. Um, let's just go backwards. We all want to have hope, right? How do we get that? By being men of character. How do we be men of character? By persevering. How do we persevere? We need something to persevere through. We need suffering. How do we do all this? And who do we do it for? Jesus. Let's be courageous throughout it all. Thank you, guys.
I actually have, uh, I have two more minutes before I got to go to commercial break. Is that cool? Two more minutes? I know you guys are probably like, all right, let's get out of here. I got two minutes, and then we can actually like technically pull this off and like time-wise pull this off. That would be amazing. Uh, last point. Um, my relationship with God has grown in nine days because I, I get it more. Like, I'm Jack's dad, and God is my dad. Right, like that, like I was talking to a guy who has kids, and he explained that to me before I had kids, and I didn't, but like I totally get it. Like, totally get it. And like, more than anything, I just want to be with my son. I want to love on him. I want to roll around with him. I want to laugh with him. I want to cry with him. I want to pour my life into him. I want to pour my heart into him. And, and the flip side, more than anything, I want him to be with me. I want him to want to be with me. And I'm sure dads here who have older kids, 12, 13, whatever, have had that moment when it's like, whatever, dad. Right? Like, I'm ashamed of you. I don't want to be with you or whatever. That's painful. And I think of God, he does the same thing to me. Right? He wants to pour his love out on me. He wants to discipline me. He wants to properly train me. He wants to laugh with me and cry with me. And just my whole life, and even after becoming a disciple, like so often I tell him I don't need you. Even my actions. I don't need you. I don't have time for you. I got to show prep. I got to go to work. I got to do this. I got to do that. I don't have time for you, Dad. You're last on my mind. You're last in my heart. I'll call you when I need something. That's how I'm treating my dad. So we're in a war. Before we got, uh, my wife got pregnant, we were talking about it, and she's a warrior. And she said, do we really want to bring a kid into this crazy world? And I said, yes. The world needs our son. I hope. So I pray that Jack is a great warrior, and I pray the same for you men here as well. You guys are awesome. Thanks for having me.